Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Resident Education Club of the Society of Skeletal Radiology. Today, we have a fellowship panel consisting of three of the newest members of the MSK community, and that's Menorah Lake, who is a Mount Auburn resident and is a current fellow at UCSD. We have Phil Asamoa, who's a current resident at the University of Colorado and future fellow at MGH. And we have Eddie Zandi Van Rilland, who was a resident at Beth Israel Deaconess and now is a Stanford fellow. And we have seven fellowship program directors from a variety of different programs in terms of size, location, and flavor. We have David Jamark from University of Colorado. We have Philip Souza from the University of Miami. We have Artemis Petridis from the University of Cincinnati. We have Imran Omar from Northwestern, Drew Ross from the University of Wisconsin, Robert Morris from the University of Mississippi, and Christine Rowald from the University of Washington. You also have me, I'm Connie Chang from MGH as your host and Jeff Belair from Thomas Jefferson as your co-host. And we wanna thank all of our panelists and you, our audience, um, who are our future potential colleagues for joining us today. So a few quick announcements before we get started. First of all, Jeff will give a quick presentation on the nuts and bolts of the application process. Then we will have six rounds of predetermined questions and only a few members of the group will answer each question, but don't worry, all the answers will be in the chat box and the contents will be emailed out later. So don't you know, worry about reading through those right now. And then at the very end, uh, Jeff, who will be monitoring the chat box during this time, um, will do a little live Q&A with the questions that you put into the chat box. So at any point, feel free to enter something in and we will address those at the end. All right, that's all I have for now. So without further ado, Jeff, please take it away. All right, great. Thanks so much, Connie. Appreciate the introduction. All right. So um, just a couple uh, comments on the MSK uh, Fellowship Match timeline. Um, as those of you who have applied this year are uh, hopefully already aware, the um, programs were allowed to start accepting applications on August 1st. Um, and uh, fellowships can begin interviews in uh, November on November 7th. Um, uh, personally, at Jefferson, we typically start interviews in uh, January. It's probably pretty variable among different programs. Um, so, uh, you know, you may expect, um, you know, to hear back from programs from different uh, time points, uh, you know, based on how quickly they're able to review applications. Uh, the match opens in March 20, uh, 2023, March 23rd, um, and uh, pro uh, programs must complete interviews by March 31st. Uh, rankings open on April 20th, and uh, the rank order list deadline is June 1st. Um, so that's when we have to put in our rank, our final rank order list and certify it. And on June 15th, 2023, that's match day. So that's just kind of a rundown of the uh, timeline. Again, um, this information is available on the SSR website, so I encourage you to use that as a resource, um, and we try to uh, keep that information up to date. Um, here's some additional resources here, so just some links um, to this uh, skeletal radiology uh, resources. Uh, and then um, this last link here is for uh, the SCARD um, policies, which I'll uh, touch on in a second here. So um, applying and interviewing. Um, most programs will accept a common application. Um, we certainly do at Jefferson. Um, the application review and interview timeline is highly variable, again, amongst programs. We're currently reviewing applications right now um, and probably won't send out invitations until sometime um, in November. And then again, we typically hold interviews in January, but that may be variable um, between programs. All interviews this year are going to be virtual again. Um, that's per the SCARD embargo and um, no on-site visits are allowed. So that includes both for interviews um, and any sort of visitations um, to a program you may be interested in that is not, um, not allowed by SCARD uh, very specifically this year. Um, you can see the SCARD website uh, for additional embargo uh, exceptions um, that are listed that, uh, on that website that I just provided. 
Um, internal versus external candidates, that's often a question that I get asked. Um, you know, each program may handle that a little bit differently. Uh, at Jefferson, I, you know, I typically have internal interest, um, but I do not only take internal candidates. So I would never design a rank order list in which I would only match internal folks if we're going to be interviewing external candidates. Um, in my opinion, that's um, you know, just not fair to to external folks who would be potentially interviewing with us. Um, but other programs may do things somewhat differently. Um, and uh, I'm sure some of the other uh, folks here uh, today on the panel would love to address that question as well. Um, this is just the uh, list of those programs that have submitted the uh, Memorandum of Understanding, um, which is an agreement uh, to participate um, and abide by the rules of the uh, MSK Fellowship match. This is just a little um, graphic here that I wanted to show you. Um, this is available on the on the uh, SSR website as well. I kind of broke this down um, a little bit further into five geographic regions here. And this just kind of shows how many programs are in each region. So in the West, we have 14 programs, the majority of which are in California, but we also have some, you know, some additional states represented there. In the Southwest, um, seven programs. In the Midwest, 22 programs. In the Northeast, 23 programs. Um, and, and in the Southeast, 20 programs. So again, you can find um, the list of all of these programs uh, on the SSR website. And that'll also have links to um, the program websites, as well as contact information for the program director and the program coordinator. Uh, just to um, touch uh, on the MSK match statistics over the last three years, um, I just want to um, show you this information because it's, it's uh, in my opinion, very reassuring to those that are interested in MSK. Um, there's a very high match percentage for our subspecialty. Um, and uh, while we do have unfilled positions, uh, you know, fairly consistently each year, the number of unfilled positions are decreasing, but in fact, the number of um, successful matches are increasing, in fact. So the, this is 2020, our kind of inaugural uh, match year. And in 2021, we saw, um, you know, that, in, that number increased to 90, uh, I think that says 98.7, it's a little bit blurry on my end. Um, and then unfilled positions, we had 28%. And then this past year, we had a 98.8% um, match success rate, and the number of unfilled positions fell to 20.8. Now, this also does um, reflect, um, that, you know, one of the main differences between this is the Canadian, um, uh, you know, program fell off the list here, but um, so that may affect things a little bit. And you'll see that the number of enrolled programs may um, change a little bit year to year, depending on um, programs that may uh, not wish to participate in the match, but the majority of programs participate in the match. And uh, I think this is really, uh, um, you know, a very nice highlight of, of the success that our applicants have had um, matching it to MSK. Uh, again, just to, uh, you know, kind of display the, the panelists that'll be participating tonight. Um, these are all of our names and um, our contact and uh, emails. Um, if anyone needs to get in touch. All right. That's all I have. Um, I guess we can get into the uh, panel discussion now. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, I, uh, I saw your presentation before and I still learn stuff. Like I didn't realize how high the match percentage is for applicants. And I think that you're right. That's very uh, reassuring and should really encourage people to apply because there are so many spots and so many great programs out here with so much variety as we're going to see here. And one thing that did occur to me that came up <clears throat> in my mind that, um, by the way, if any uh, of our participants or, or people who are viewing this who have questions now about what Jeff said, please put it in now. But while we're uh, waiting for potential questions to come in, because we're actually a little ahead of schedule, um, one question that came up, I think people might have during your presentation was um, just sort of surveying our program directors here in terms of when you send out uh, invites and when you interview, because I do think that is very variable. So if our panelists could just uh, type their answers or they can just we can just go around uh, and say our answers. So let's start with David. 
when do you guys interview or yeah, so put out invitations? We're in the same we're in the same spot where we're we're reviewing them now. I expect it to be a multi-week process. Um, I feel like this arrow has moved a little bit year to year. We'll probably send out interviews in the next couple of weeks, and we'll probably do it right around the turn of the year, so late December, early January, somewhere around there. Awesome, thanks. How about you, Drew? We're reviewing applications now. We're probably a little bit on the earlier side compared to the other programs. So we send out uh, usually three waves of interview invites starting mid-October and going into early November. And we interview in two week blocks in November, December, and January. Got it. How about you, Robert? Uh, we actually review the applications as they come in and just kind of send invites as, as they come across. And uh, we usually do our interviews the latter half of December or first half of January. Hmm, awesome. Uh, Imran? Uh, so we've been, uh, we've finished most of our uh, review now. We've been uh, sending out uh, invites uh, uh, for the first batch now. Uh, our interview season uh, is anywhere between November to February. We try and do smaller batches uh, and do it a little bit more uh, frequently just to give some of the applicants more flexibility as to when they schedule with us. Hmm. How about Christine? Hi, yeah, we um, at UW, the University of Washington, that is, we haven't started sending out any invitations. In fact, we haven't even begun reviewing applications. We're doing that now. <laughs> and our goal is to have that done by next week. So hopefully application or invitations to interview will be sent out um, soon after that. Um, and we too sort of have an elongated interview season, typically from November through February. Um, I suspect we'll start in November, but we don't have the dates dialed yet. But um, yeah. How about Artemis? Oh, sorry. How about you, Artemis? Uh, so we usually start looking within the next month. We'll start looking at applications and start sending out invites, uh, usually in November. And then we don't actually interview typically till January because we we wait till most of the residency stuff is over, just so it won't overload our uh, our system. <laughs> I understand that. And then Omar. Oops. Is he frozen? Omar? Sorry, I, I had responded already. Oh, you did. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did I get everybody? Did I miss somebody? I think I missed me, but for, for, for us. Oh, we, sorry. No worries. Sorry, Felipe. <laughs> no worries. So we are reviewing the applications right now. We're probably going to send the invitation like late November and interviewing like around December, January. December, January. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. So we, uh, I've reviewed some of the applications, but they seem to still be coming in. And so uh, I, I don't plan to, ISS is next week, which I think some of us will be at. And so I don't plan to send out anything till after that at the earliest. And we don't interview, we kind of do it a later. So January to March. So what I get from this though, is that if you haven't applied yet, it's really not too late. <laughs> if you're thinking about it, you should do it uh, because you have a great chance of matching and, um, and we're still very, very early in the process. So um, thanks everyone for the first question. So we haven't, um, I didn't get any uh, questions in the chat yet. So I'm gonna move forward. I have so, some questions in the Q and A. Do you want us to address Oh, you them? do. Oh, sorry, I didn't see them. Yeah, yeah sure, if there's something. Uh, yeah. Be. Oh, so, I see. Yep. So the first comment here was just about sharing contact information. This will be uh, recorded and uploaded, I believe. So we could reference that. I could also, you know, provide the PowerPoint for anybody that's interested. Um, maybe uh, Patrick can distribute that uh, to those who are uh, registered. Um, second question here: Is there a list of programs that offer the four-year fellowship alternate pathway for IMGs who are ECFMG certified and have finished DR residency? In their home country, anyone want I don't to know. One? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we do. We do have those, but I don't know if there is a list out there that has those. So we, at yeah, we University will of also... Washington. We um, we accept fellows on the ABR pathway, the four-year pathway at for MSK. In fact, we have one of our slots, match slots, exempt from the match, so that uh, we can accommodate someone on the pathway. Wonderful. Yeah, we also um, have uh, fellows that are in the four-year pathway, although none of them have uh, have done the MSK fellowship um, in the last several years, if I recall. But um, certainly, you know, someone wouldn't be prohibited from doing that. 
All right. Um, is there any penalty for DO applicants who did not take step three, but successfully passed step one and two, um, but they've passed their COMLEX? Uh, in, in my opinion, there would be no penalty for that. Um, you know, COMLEX is, is sufficient. Oftentimes we have, you know, um, those who have done their COMLEX also submit their step one and two scores. Um, so that, you know, may provide additional information, um, but certainly um, taking, sit, not sitting for step three doesn't affect affect anything from our um, from our end. Um, and actually, that is a perfect segue into our first question <laughs> directed at program directors. Um, so uh, David and Drew, you guys will be answering this one. So gear up. So uh, I was wondering if you guys, because you know, uh, lots of applicants are curious about this, could just describe briefly how you select uh, applicants for interview and, um, and ultimately you know, what's going through your mind when you're making your rank list. Um, and to everybody else, uh, um, uh, sorry, to all the other uh, viewers, don't worry, like everybody is going to answer this, you'll have everybody's answer to this question later in the chat. So just, you know, don't worry about reading all the details for now. So, but anyway, David, David and Drew, please. David first. <laughs> sure, I'll start. Well, thanks everybody. It was great tonight. Uh, so in Colorado, we perform a holistic review, much like probably most other programs do. Uh, so we've weighed the basic common application components, so your research you've done, where you've been. Your personal statement actually is, is kind of important because it's the only real like free form response. I get to like get to know who you are before actually talking with you. And then as, as well as your letters of recommendation, you know, MSK is starting to get to a pretty small club where we all know each other. And so it's common that we'll know a lot of the letter, writer, letter writers. Um, and then I think the other things are all the programs are so different um, in terms of kind of what their strengths or their focuses are. So like here at Colorado, for example, we're a little bit more procedural heavy. Um, and so we like our applicants to kind of share that um, that same kind of passion we have for, for the procedural side as well. I think somebody who doesn't want to do procedures would probably not, you know, maybe this would not be the best year for them. And so um, we look through and kind of see people who kind of share those interests and I think regardless of, of what the strength is of the program, um, that's those are components that program directors are looking for. Um, so letters of rec and emails from mentors can really go a long ways here. The really only difference in the rank list is, is how you did in your in your interview. You know, we we go into these interviews with kind of a formulated idea of, of who you are and, and, and what kind of a fellow you could be. And then we're mostly just spending the interview confirming that and making sure you're interested legitimately in, in, in kind of what we're doing and, and you're not a serial killer. So you throw all those <laughs> together and that's kind of what it is. Um, so it's it's the same as residency in that sense that we're looking at the whole package, but we're really dialed down. I mean, you're a you're a, a junior faculty member essentially with a lot of us in the section. Um, and so it's it's looking at you as a colleague as well. Totally. How about you, Drew? Well, I totally agree with what David said. And just to talk about a few things um, that we really look for here uh, for University of Wisconsin. I think some type of voluntary leadership role goes a long way. So when I see people who've been chief resident um, or who've taken on a serious PQI project or done some sort of volunteer work, um, that looks like more than a line item on their CV, but they really went out of their way to make an impact um, on their local community. That speaks a lot to us. So that's a big thing. Uh, and then as David said, you know, every program's different. We get a lot of applications, more than we can interview. But that said, we go pretty deep in our rank list to fill five slots um, because most people apply to a lot of programs. So one thing that's really helpful is if as an applicant, you can personalize your application and make a convincing case that you have a specific interest in that program that you're sending the application to. Um, when I see that someone's taken the time to do that and explain why they think University of Wisconsin would be a great fit for them for fellowship, I'm really impressed. And I'm like, oh, this person's really thought through what they want to do for a fellowship. Um, after that, you know, for making the rank list performance um, at the interview is a factor. Most of the time people do fine on the interview, so I wouldn't worry about that. It could bump you up or down a little bit, but it's rare to have someone come in and bomb the interview. You know, people do okay, and you will too when you apply. Um, but those are the factors that we look for. Awesome. So I think like a cultural fit, the leadership, and I, I kind of heard this more indirectly from you, but directly from David, like we're basically looking for our future staff and future colleagues. So, um, you know, we're really looking for somebody who's going to fit in the section potentially long term, because most of, at least for us, most of our, our hires come from our fellows too. So, um, 
I'm going to move on to the other side of this question. So Menor and Phil, you guys are up. So actually all three of you, Eddie as well, you guys all decided to move across the country pretty much for your fellowships. Um, uh, and that's uh, some, you know, a lot of people decide to stay at their home institutions. So could both of you describe a little bit, uh, Menor and Phil, how you made that decision and how you chose where to apply and ultimately uh, where you chose where you end up. And we'll start with you, Menor. Yes. Um, so I was really excited and looking for something new and a change for me. I was um, at Mount Auburn, like you said um, earlier, Dr. Chang, um, and I'd been there for five years. I did my prelim year and my radiology residency, um, and I knew that I wanted to be able to explore living in, in, in California. Um, then on top of that, I also am looking to live on the, on the West Coast afterwards after I'm done with all of my, my training. So all of that was all in line with my big move across the country. Yeah, how about you, Phil? Yeah, um, and to follow up on uh, what Menorah said, um, for me, I think uh, in a similar vein, I was just looking to, I really applied uh, all across the country to a wide variety of institutions. Um, I came into the process and I was very open to any possibilities. Um, and so more than anything, it wasn't like I was determined to make a long distance move, um, so much as I was just looking to expose myself to different programs. Um, and consider, you know, a variety of, um, you know, experiences. And throughout the course of, you know, my training, I've been at a lot of different uh, institutions, and I think there's just uh, something about having a diversity of thoughts, diversity of experiences, diversity of people and personalities that makes a difference. Um, I do believe institutional bias is a real thing, and um, you can experience that if you're at the same institution. Um, so I just uh, wanted to have an opportunity to uh, gain a different experience and to grow professionally. Um, thank you everybody who's uh, participating tonight as well. So we're really excited to have you here uh, and hopefully you benefit from this greatly. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really insightful to both of you guys. And I do think that diversity of thought is important. Uh, Jeff briefly touched on this before, but that's why we like to kind of mix things up too. We like to bring people from the outside, you know, some stay, but to have that mix is I think really great. Um, so uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit. So Felipe and Imran, you're up. <laughs> so <clears throat> virtual recruitment is a challenge for everybody on our side uh, and the applicant side. So I'm just curious um, if you've altered anything uh, in your process for virtual recruitment, and maybe you could describe briefly how the process is and so people know what to expect. Uh, Felipe, why don't you start? Okay, I think I think the virtual recruitment like changed a lot. No, I think if you compare like five years ago now, I think we interviewed much more people. Like the number of interviews has grown like ridiculous. Like right now, it's fast. No, so I think that uh, as Drew said before, like the interview like lost a little bit of like the importance in the selection because with the Zoom we cannot know like. Before we would spend like the day with the candidate, we had lunch, we had like spend a lot of time. Now with Zoom, it's a little bit different. I think we don't know very well the candidate. So I think it's just like to detect some like red flags or to see something, but I don't think the interview right now is like uh, the biggest component of the of the selection. And I think before I think was much more important, like the comp the, the weight of the interview before was higher. So for now, for us, like the number of interviews, like it's much more like right now. So interviewing much more people. So, and uh, that was like my, my opinion, like the biggest change of like the process was before the pandemic and now with the, the virtual recruitment. So I think, and with that, we changed the way we select the, the candidate to interview, but we most like, because we can interview a lot of people, we are, I don't know if the word's gonna be right, but like we're less selective. Like we are interviewing more people when we are getting like more more candidates in the bunch. I think that's I think you're less selective in the interview process. Well, that's also excellent for the applicants to hear too. I think <laughs> in a way they're um, more likely to get to see more programs. I mean, how about you, Imran? Uh, yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of the same things that uh, Felipe was uh, talking about. Uh, we have uh, you know, a broader range of the country that is applying to us. And I think most programs are, are seeing that. So we're seeing a lot of people from the East Coast and the West Coast. Traditionally, we would get a lot of people from the, uh, the Midwest. 
And so it's nice to be able to have that uh, you know, greater number of, of regions that are, are uh, you know, represented in our application pool. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's given us a lot of flexibility. First of all, we're trying to be flexible uh, in when we offer interviews, uh, how frequently we uh, offer interviews, the number of people that we're, uh, we're interviewing. It also allows our staff to be able to have flexibility as well when we don't have necessarily to construct an entire day for people to come in, uh, make sure that they're having lunch. We're able to provide uh, you know, more, more time with the staff to interview people. Um, uh, unfortunately, as Felipe said, you know, we may not have that real in-depth uh, full day experience that we had with some of our uh, uh, applications uh, previously, uh, but uh, it certainly has helped us uh, to be able to see a lot more people. Uh, the other thing that we uh, did uh, spend a, quite a bit of time on uh, is to make sure some of our uh, web resources were a little bit uh, more uh, kind of representative of what we are trying to portray here. Unfortunately, people who came to us were able to see the character of our program, uh, hopefully the esprit de corps among the staff, the facilities, and they can't see any of that now. So programs themselves may look uh, very similar one to another, and it's hard to get that, dif uh, that differentiation between them. So at least giving them some resources online uh, to be able to ask some of the questions during their day, uh, you know, and then maybe review these things afterwards uh, may provide them with, uh, with some of those resources. So hopefully, uh, you know, that'll give them, uh, you know, some, uh, some information later on that uh, they can use when they're going through the match process. Yeah, so I, I agree. I think definitely that the flexibility is a huge thing, allowing us to, you know, I definitely have applicants can't meet with a certain person a certain day, they can just schedule a call later. So that that's also very, um, very nice. It's, I guess, the advantage of it being a long process, as opposed to the quick race that we had before, which is interview, interview, offer, offer. <laughs> now we have more time as well. Um, uh, Patrick, I'm going to slightly change the order of this question, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, Phil and Eddie, you guys are up next. So to kind of complement that, given that everything is virtual, can you give our applicants some advice about the best way to find about, about the programs that you're interested in since you can't be there physically? And now, like last year, we could kind of visit afterwards with no pressure, but now that's even gone. So what are some suggestions you guys have about finding out more about the programs? Phil, why don't you start with this one? Yeah, thanks, Connie. So um, what I'll say is, you know, this, there's a lot uh, to unpack in this question. Um, and I could, you know, go on and on about it. Uh, hopefully, you guys will receive, uh, you know, my, my more thorough uh, answer response on this question. Um, but ultimately, I think the first starting point certainly is, uh, you know, a common resource, we all use the internet. So I started out looking at um, program websites based on programs that initially drew my interest. And I think actually, the website um, has a big role to play in terms of just based on its layout um, and how it's configured um, in terms of, you know, uh, just the layout, um, how it attracts, you know, candidates and uh, makes them perceive the program. Um, so that's, you know, a good initial screener. And then, um, you know, I, I gained a lot of information through word of mouth as well, um, talking with um, some of my faculty colleagues uh, at my home institution at the University of Colorado, um, talking with some of the current fellows uh, NMSK at the University of Colorado as well. Um, I think word of mouth is a great way to find out more information because um, people are so, as was alluded to earlier, um, the MSK world is small and people are really connected and you can get a lot of uh, insider information um, that way. And so I think that's a good way as well to uh, gain a lot of insights uh, about just the process and different programs. And the last thing I would refer you to is since this is, you know, a Society of Scalable Radiology panel, uh, the SSR website is also a great resource uh, for further information on the match process. Um, so definitely refer to that. Use everything and uh, anything uh, available at your disposal to, to help you out. So would be my advice. That was a great answer. Thanks, Phil. Don't worry, they will get your other answer as well. How about you, Eddie? Yeah, just um, echoing kind of what Phil mentioned there. Um, I think when I made my initial list, you know, I didn't really know too much in terms about the reputation of different programs. So I relied very heavily on all my faculty mentors, um, senior residents in my program who had gone, to, who had applied to MSK the year before, and also former MSK fellows. So I think just utilizing all the resources at your disposal to get as many like opinions and and sort of gain insight into different programs is definitely a good way to kind of make that initial list of programs. Um, once you kind of get to the interview stage, um, I, I thought that the virtual interviews were all were all pretty good in terms of getting a sense of the the program, the people. Um, I think the main downside, as as was mentioned earlier, is not getting a sense of the sort of atmosphere of the reading room, um, the area, um, the hospital, 
um, I think that's a really tough thing to kind of get a sense of. So what I did was I reached out to a lot of uh, current MSK fellows at those programs when I was uh, interviewing and um, just kind of reached out to them. And we, with a few of them was mostly just email exchanges. Others, we um, talked on the phone and I thought that was really helpful and to, to get a little bit more insight into how the actual program is and how it is on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's maybe some, you know, just a brief, uh, you know, word of advice in terms of trying to get a sense of a place after you've interviewed. Oh, that's really helpful, Eddie. And that reminds me. So, um, you know, for us, we have these little fellow only sessions uh, with the applicants. But if you want more time with a fellow, I think all of us uh, are happy to send you names, numbers, or not numbers necessarily, but emails for sure. We'll let the we'll let the fellows decide if they want to give their numbers. But um, definitely emails, contacts of current or past fellows that you know you can chat with them as well. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Christine and Artemis, you guys are up, and Jeff briefly brought up this before. So what about internal versus external applicants? Um, you know, how do you, what's your policy? How do you view? Do you weigh one more than the other? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, Artemis, let's start with you. Uh, sure, yeah. So we accept two fellows a year. Uh, if we have uh, current residents who are interesting in staying and express that we are their top choice and they don't want to go elsewhere, then we will typically fill internally and then not participate in the match or the interview or anything. So we were not wasting anybody's time. Um, if we have one interested candidate, then we'll interview for the second position. Uh, and um, if we do have internal residents who are interested in staying on as our fellows, however, if they don't express that we're their top choice, so they're still looking elsewhere, they have interest in going somewhere else, we will interview them, we will interview external candidates as well, uh, but we will typically rank them first, we will give them priority, um, and then if, you know, depending on what they decide, if it doesn't, then we will rank all the external candidates that um, we interviewed, but we only will do that if we have the available positions to, um, for candidates. Got it. How about you guys, Christine? Yeah, so we take, I mean, both internal and external candidates. We typically do not have um, enough internal candidates to fill, of our, fill all of our positions. And in fact, we're expanding to four fellows. We're currently three, but we're expanding to four next year. So we'll have plenty of slots available. So um, certainly if there is an internal candidate that's interested, we tend to rank them highly if they want to stay. It's, um, you know, they're a known quantity and we want to want to keep them if they're interested in staying, but every year, I mean, all of our fellows this year are external candidates and we welcome all to apply. <laughs> all right, that's wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Hope that addresses uh, some applicants' concerns about that particular question. All right, so I'm gonna go back to uh, Manor and Eddie. So what are some things that you are glad you asked your programs about or kind of wish that you had in retrospect is kind of like a follow-up to the last question. And Eddie, you're going to start with, you start on this one. Okay. Um, yeah, I think during the interviews, we had like ample time to ask uh, faculty fellows a lot of questions. I think the ones that I'm glad that I asked uh, during the interview days were um, things like what are strengths of the program? What are areas to improve to kind of get a sense of, you know, is the program going in, in a good direction? Or are they trying to make improvements to, to, the, to the program and to the section? Um, you know, major changes, I think that's always a good one to ask about to, to make sure that there's kind of stability and, and also no, no like surprises when you actually get there uh, about a year and a half after you apply and get accepted. So um, those are some of the main ones. Other smaller ones, I guess, in the age of COVID uh, readouts, are those virtual? Do you send studies or do you actually get read out? It's another important thing that I, um, when I was doing residency interviews, I guess a lot of uh, potential resident applicants were asking that. So I use that as well. And then um, sort of academic expectations, opportunities. Um, I think that's another good one to ask um, because a lot of places will give you some academic time to do research and, and to explore your academic uh, interests. So um, those are some things I, I'm glad I asked. Um, pretty much most things I, I did have an opportunity to ask, but you know, certain things like call, I think is another good one to ask like the fellows, if you have a chance to speak with fellows, uh, moonlighting opportunities, um, things like overall atmosphere and and how the sort of area of the city is, and then like academic and conference time, um, how that works as well. So um, I, I think I have a list of questions um, that that will be sent out that I, I ask pretty much all programs kind of standardized across the board. And for me, um, I'm really grateful that I asked uh, each program what their approach was to actually teaching. Uh, because every program does it uh, differently, different things are weighed, um, different um, 
cultures. So, and, and I found just learning about myself throughout my whole journey in medicine, um, I learn best when there's time for case conferences and also even didactics. Um, and I'm also really glad that I got a chance to ask the fellows that I met, but also the actual staff um, during each interview, what it was that made them feel like they were a good fit for that, that program, for that area, just to see uh, what it is that people like about different areas, different places. Thanks, Menorah. And thanks, Menorah, for moving ahead when I had muted myself and didn't realize it. So oh, no, that's okay. Thank you for taking charge. That was great. <laughs> um, so I hope that helps people a little bit as well. So we're going to switch back gears. Robert and Omar, you guys are up. Um, so the next question is, um, what's the best way for an applicant to communicate with your program? And then also kind of related question is, does it help or hurt to have, you know, for <clears throat> applicants themselves to email you or uh, to ask somebody else to contact you? Um, and a related question I see in the Q&A is what about the timing of that? Is it better to ask now before the interviews go out or later or both or, you know, either? Um, Robert, why don't you start with that one? Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm from a small program. We usually have one at most two fellows a year. Um, so for my program, if you want to communicate with me, just communicate or with us, communicate directly with me is the best thing. Um, that may be an advantage. Um, I don't know, honestly, but, you know, there's no layers of bureaucracy in my program. It's just, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the attendings and the fellows, nobody else you got to go through. Um, as far as the second part of the question, um, you know, somebody, it's pretty, letters of recommendation are great, but everybody's always going to get somebody to write something nice about them. Um, if somebody went out of their way to contact me about any particular person, I mean, I would take that to mean, you know, a, that would be a very, very positive recommendation. That would, you know, that would just stand out in my mind. Um, so, and I think anytime in the interview process, that would be effective if there was somewhere you're really interested in. Got it. Imran, how about you? Uh, yeah, I think it absolutely helps uh, for uh, for interested applicants to uh, reach out to us uh, anytime during the uh, the process. They can either reach out to me or our uh, educational coordinator, um, and that just shows a level of interest in the program. That uh, you know, we oftentimes when candidates are close, we will use that in order to maybe uh, show that that interest shows some genuine uh, kind of. Uh, uh, interest in our program and, and put that uh, person a little bit ahead of other people. Uh, it's definitely uh, uh, useful for us. And then, uh, you know, just echoing what uh, other people have mentioned before, anytime somebody shows some more interest uh, that's uh, personalized to a particular program, uh, that also is a good way of, of, uh, of, uh, of illustrating your, your genuine interest in that program. So uh, letters of recommendation or uh, personal statements that, uh, that have that personalized touch are, are always nice to see. Great. Well, uh, program directors, get ready for your inboxes to explode. <laughs> um, I, I, I think uh, just to counterbalance that a little bit, though, I do think it's important for applicants to use it carefully, just like when you're applying for residency. Uh, only show, say, this is your number one program, if it is actually your number one program, because I think Phil said this before, it's a very small community. So like you basically want to maintain all bridges <laughs> in life, I think. So, um, all right. So our last uh, um, uh, pre-planned question is for all three of our newest members of the MSK community. So all three of you get ready. So um, can you just tell a little bit about, and the, at the very end, what kind of influenced your rank list um, and uh, the top three things that influenced your rank list? So uh, Manor, let's start with you. Yes, so for my top three, for looking at um, where to apply, but also even to um, on how to organize my, my rank list, I really was valuing um, the department culture. I wanted to find a place of a place of a community culture of support so that I could continue to grow in academics. Um, I also was looking for an emphasis in didactic lectures because that really feeds towards my, my learning style and I also really valued weather. Um, so each of those three were important for me across the whole board, um, and then getting a sense again of the actual departmental culture that I got from the Zoom interviews and all my, my um, conversations was also helpful. Um, those are all the, the, the main key things, and I, of course, along the whole way, I always um, 
talked with my mentors and that was very helpful to get their insight, their thoughts on different places and um, even my own thoughts on there. So each of those things were very helpful for me making all of my list. How about you, Eddie? Yeah, so for me, uh, number one thing, most important thing was sort of quality and strength of the clinical training. And, you know, again, I didn't have much insight into different programs prior to starting this process. So um, I relied heavily on my faculty mentors and residency, um, co-residents, prior fellows, and um, kind of used their input to, to kind of help me decide what programs truly had good clinical training. Um, secondly, opportunities to be involved in like education, research, other academic opportunities. I was very interested in all that during residency. So I wanted to have the, those opportunities during fellowship. And I think even if you're not, um, you know, into, uh, you know, research or education um, now, uh, you know, that could change. So I think at least having those opportunities during fellowship um, is, is definitely something to consider. And then lastly, uh, geography um, for me, I, most of my family's Midwest, West Coast and in Hawaii. So I think being closer to the West Coast was, was an important factor for me. Um, and kind of, I definitely still apply to, you know, big, the big name um, places on the East Coast, but, um, you know, my third kind of criteria was, was definitely geography. Got it. And Phil? Yeah, for me, I would say, so number one was the comprehensiveness of the overall training experience, uh, getting exposure to a variety of different procedures uh, and diagnostic imaging modalities, um, and also getting to work with um, faculty of varying uh, experience levels as well, um, I think was very important. Um, for me, um, that was my number one question by far. Coming into the process, I asked myself, where do I feel like I could get the absolute best uh, training experience possible? Um, it's one year fellowship. It's a short year, but you want to really maximize the yield of that year. You want to squeeze every ounce of potential out of that year. And so for me, I, I wanted to make sure I was in a place where I could do that. And in addition to just even the clinical experience, um, as Eddie mentioned, um, you know, I've been involved in a variety of uh, extracurricular activities as well and leadership experiences. And so I wanted to have the opportunity to continue some of that and, um, you know, my own professional self-development wherever I ended up. So that by far to me was the number one criterion. Um, after that, um, I, I looked at geography. Um, again, I can live anywhere for a year, um, but um, I think geography, you know, matters to everybody to some extent, um, certainly. And then the third criteria for me was uh, the name brand and the reputation of um, each program as well. Um, and in a lot of sense, um, I, I gained a sense of that. Um, and again, just, you know, the culture um, and the quality of experience by talking with people who are experienced in MSK, particularly in my own department, I think. Um, I can't emphasize it enough, but word of mouth, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people absolutely makes a difference in, in the overall decision-making process. So I would highly encourage you to, to do that. Awesome, great answers, all of you. And, and you all three brought up that you really have uh, MSK mentors. And so there may be some of you applicants out there who are like, oh, I don't really have that in my program, I'm a small residency, that kind of thing. And actually, so the SSR, the scholars program really was designed for that. Um, to really, in part, to help out those programs who don't have that MSK mentorship. And the SSR really can be a good resource for those of you <clears throat> who don't feel like you have those connections to make some of those connections. So if you're interested in finding out more, definitely reach out to us. Um, all right, Jeff, I'm going to let you kind of uh, hopefully you've sorted through the Q&A and can kind of guide us a little bit now for the, uh, the free form section. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so we have some questions here that are probably more directed to the, uh, um, to, you know, the uh, folks that are joining us, Eddie, Philip, and, uh, and Menor. Um, how many programs should each applicant aim to apply for? I'll share my thoughts on that one. Sure. Um, I think, um, I remember thinking of that question um, two years ago when I was applying, but then also thinking about that when I was looking for a place for, for residency. And I think the answer is pretty much the same. There's not really a magic number. It's about what you feel comfortable with. Um, and uh, the great thing, and one of my, my favorite resources that I had throughout that whole process was the SSR um, website that we had um, showcased earlier. It really helped me to get an idea of what my options are by the state. Um, and so that was really helpful. So really just whatever feels right to you to make it feel that you would be happy with what your, your list becomes. It's always helpful to kind of fast forward in your mind to think, would I be happy if I had just these um, to make sure that you'll be happy with, with where you're, you're taking yourself. 
Yeah, that's a great, a great answer. I think it's important to consider, you know, many different things. One would be, you know, if you have an, an, a potential internal spot available, if you ha are, are from a program that, um, you know, has a fellowship that you'd be interested in attending, um, you know, how strong, uh, you know, you feel that your application is, um, that's another consideration. And, and then certainly, you know, kind of the geographic spread that you're interested in. So uh, I think those are all important considerations. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, is Andy Van Rilland here? All right. When you were an applicant emailing fellows, this one's directed specifically for you. When you were an applicant emailing fellows, what kinds of questions did you find most useful to get a feel for the program? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it was just like asking them directly. Um, you know, are they happy in their program? You know, what what are their favorite aspects of the program? Are you do you have time to hang out with your co-fellows? Um, you know, how is like kind of wellness, are there wellness initiatives, things like that, I think are all important things, um, or things that you could potentially ask. Um, but oftentimes, you know, a lot of them would just say, hey, if you want to give me a call, here's my number. And, and uh, we just talk, kind of have a casual conversation on the phone. I think that was usually the best way to get a sense of, you know, how happy they truly were, because I think sometimes things get kind of lost in the emails. But, um, but yeah, I think either way, um, any sort of additional information that you can, you can kind of get through contacting them via emails or via phone calls is, is definitely helpful. Great. Um, this question looks like it's, I think it was directed um, for you, David. Uh, how does your program define procedure heavy? Does that mean a variety of cases or strictly volume? I think it's, I think it's a combination of, of both. Um, obviously, our goal is still to make you an MSK radiologist. And so the central feature of this is diagnostic imaging. Um, but in this case, I think that someone in our program would expect to be able to leave and be a competent independent person who does biopsies, vertebral augmentation, spine injections, et cetera. Um, so an important thing for someone who's applying would be to understand what they're looking for procedurally and to ask about which programs do that or don't do that. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of both, um, but I, I view it as you would be able to leave and be able to do this independently in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, um, you know, for programs that are very procedure heavy, I think coming in with a basic grasp of ultrasound um, guided procedures, CT guided procedures, and knowing how to do arthrograms is is appropriate um, for the you know recent uh, resident graduate. Um, and you know certainly there's a lot of support you'll get throughout your fellowship year, but um, I, I completely agree with what David said. Um, all right, let's um, have another question here. How would you prefer for applicants to express interest to your programs at this point after applications have already been sent out? Um, who'd like to take that? Dr. Uh, Morris, would you like to respond? Well, yeah, you know, the I don't have any hard and fast deadlines for when any applications are due. I mean, there, there are scarred initiated guidelines um, and I'm, I'm sure other people do, and they specifically mentioned it, um, but it'd probably just be appropriate to email the program and say, hey, can I still send you my application? I mean, if they say no, the time has passed, then I guess the ship has sailed, but if it hasn't, uh, I'm sure there are plenty of places that would be willing to, to entertain some more applicants uh, if possible. Yeah, I think, I, I think any time to reach out is fine. Um, you know, certainly if you haven't heard back from a program yet, Likely, um, it's just related to the fact that they're still reviewing applications. So, um, you know, it's it's always fine to to check in, um, but also you know have patience. Um, you will receive a response, um, even for those that we you know choose to not interview. We'll we'll send out um, you know a communication uh, stating such. So um, you will hear from the programs that you apply to eventually. All right. Um, Here's a question. Is it appropriate to ask a PD during interviews if they have interested uh, internal applicants? Artemis, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure people might feel differently about it, but I, I think it's fine if they want to ask. I will be honest and say if we have. We typically don't have that many internal candidates. Um, so it's, um, I sort of took the question as what if we would but uh, yeah I think it's okay to ask I'm, I'm sure maybe people feel differently about it but there's no harm yeah I totally agree with that I think it's a fair question and 
you know, if I'm asked that, I'll, I'll certainly answer it truth, truthfully. So um, I think I, I completely agree with that. Uh, are applications received after you begin sending interview invitations reviewed on a rolling basis for a potential interview invitation? So essentially, if somebody applies now after, you know, you've kind of received applications and have gone through them, would you still consider that uh, applicant? Um, Imran, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we are reviewing on a rolling basis. We obviously want to uh, get the, uh, the, the best applicants for us that uh, fit the culture that we have. Uh, and so if we find people that are uh, interested and look interesting and, and uh, definitely show uh, interest in our program, then we're going to offer those people uh, interviews. We want to see as many people as possible in order to get the, 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 the people that fit us the best. Yeah, that's great. I, I completely agree also. Um, you know, we review applications kind of in batch format, but um, certainly if somebody, you know, applies later than another applicant, that's not really something I take into consideration. It's, um, you know, just the strength of the application, uh, you know, looking at it itself. So um, that's kind of how we, uh, we deal with that situation. Let's see. Um, All right. On average, how many applicants do you interview and rank for one position? Who wants to take this one? Christine, would you want to answer that? Sure. I mean, we we interview virtually everyone who applies. Um, it's pretty unusual for us not to interview someone. So right now we have over 50 applications. So we'll probably interview all 50 plus. Um, and then we typically rank all 50 plus. So um, again, a, a very um, unusual circumstance where we wouldn't interview or rank someone. Great, yeah. Um, how about you, uh, Drew? Um, how do you guys deal with, I know you had mentioned, uh, you know, you also receive an overwhelming number of applications. How do you, um, you know, rank and, and uh, on average um, interview for one, for one position or for each position? It, it's tough to gauge. We get about uh, any on any given year, 50 to 60 applications. So very similar to what Christine was describing. And we interview um, around eight interviews per slot that we're filling. So we have five slots to fill. We usually have at least one, if not two internal candidates in a given year. Um, so we'll adjust up or down based on the number of internal candidates. So we don't quite interview everybody, but we interview a large proportion of our applicant pool. And that's why, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, look good. It's kind of hard to decide between. And I think if you really are interested in a specific program, a very thoughtfully worded email to the PD can make a big difference for sort of those, you know, candidates who are look fine, but you're just not sure which among them to sort of prioritize for interviews, as people have mentioned. You have to spend that wisely, but I think it can be effective. Yeah, completely agree with that. Um... All right. Can you talk a little bit about ACGME versus non-ACGME programs, please? What is the difference for the program and for the fellows? Who'd like to take that? Well, David oh, wants to take that. Oh, yeah. But I was going to say, can people. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so we're we're non-ACGME. I think the I think the uh, I think the majority of programs were non-ACGME and have been. Although I think we're seeing a little bit of a shift towards people going into ACGME. The main difference is how much paperwork the fellowship director has to do and who pays for it from the administrative side. But what it means for you um, is that the, probably the biggest thing that residents or fellows run into is that as an ACGME fellow, you're not allowed to final sign anything in your own specialty. And so the degree of moonlighting opportunities or acting as a faculty member some days or doing a procedure by yourself that um, you could do maybe once you were more experienced um, would be limited or, or would just be different. Uh, and so the makeup of that is different. I think the education you're going to get in either program is largely identical. The type of MSK radiologist you're going to be when you leave is largely identical. Um, it's just some of those things. If you have a visa, I would be careful about which program you apply to just because there's requirements that are changing with that. Um, but I, I don't know if I would necessarily use that as, as a discriminator between applying towards one program or another. It's more just understanding that there are some subtle differences and what you can and can't do and, and where your paycheck comes from and how much extra money you can make 
um, and uh, what that may mean in terms of doing other call requirements and things like that. All right, great. Yeah, we are all uh, ACGME accredited, but um, uh, and and the the points that you make are correct. Um, although, if uh, trainees have their you know full medical license in the state, they can also do moonlighting um, uh, either internally or externally. But it's there. There are some you know duty hours uh, considerations and those sort of things with uh, being ACGME accredited um, in that regard. But uh, but good answer. The, the bottom line is probably doesn't matter too much for most people. Can we just right. see, oh, sorry. Can, yeah, we go just, ahead. can we just see with a raise of hands? So which programs are ACGME who are here? Just one. And then everybody else, I'm not ACGME, who, who, who is not? Interesting, yeah. All right, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, we probably have time for one more question. Want to pick one more out of the hat? Yeah, sure, let's do this one. How do you view applicants with young families who are not as formally involved in research, leadership, uh, et cetera, due to family responsibilities? Who would like to take that? Felipe, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure. I, I see it as a good sign. I don't, I don't feel, I feel that like person has family centered is like, would be a good candidate. I like the idea of like, I'm gonna say something, especially for Miami, I like a person that has family. That's coming from my of a family, but I think it's a, I don't see it as a bad thing. Actually, I see it as a good thing. Not that that's something that's going to count positive or negative, but I think I don't discriminate because the person has family. And I, of course, I will understand that this person is going to have less free time to leadership and whole or for research. And I'm going to set up my expectations based on his family duties as well. And I think it's totally fine. It's totally acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you I agree just put a note, like, yeah, I think it's great. Just, I was a mom coming in as a fellow. I had two um, kids as a fellow and then my third as an attending. My current fellow sitting next to me has two small children. And I think it's fabulous. Um, yeah, and exactly. everyone contributes. Yeah. And I think it just adds a lot of fun to the environment. We get together, um, you know, my other, yeah. One of the other faculty members also has small children, so we'll get together with the kids, do activities. So I think it's great. That's <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I think being a parent is leadership. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the biggest. One. <laughs> so um, and and I think uh, I think previously Drew mentioned. Yeah, I mean, like we definitely look at leadership and all those things, but. I, it's not only those things. We interview a lot of the people who come across. Um, and um, yeah, anyway, so don't count yourself out is what I'm saying, you know, just apply. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to tell your story. And it, there's a variety of routes you can take to identify yourself as a compelling candidate. Many of our fellows in the past have had small kids and um, or, or had kids during fellowship even. So yeah, it's not not uncommon at all. Yeah, Drew, you have three kids. <laughs> I do. Yeah, they're not so small anymore, but uh, they were during residency and fellowship, that's for sure. All right, so we are uh, running out of time. I just want to thank everybody, all our panelists. Thank for answering the questions. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to the audience for being a part of this panel, for your interest in being a part of the MSK community. Um, I hope that we were able to confer, uh, convey that this is just a warm, friendly, fun community, and um, we really hope that you join us. And uh, as uh, I think Jeff previously mentioned, our contact information is going to be go going out. It is also all available on the SSR website, so feel free to reach out. Do not hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, that's all we've got. So thanks again, guys, and uh, we look forward to meeting with you soon.